Hello, my name is Tony Ryan. I'm a retired psychotherapist. And ever since I took my a module on echo psychology, I have looked differently at the pain that people bring to therapy sessions. I see that pain not just arising out of individual pathology and family pathology, but out of the much wider context of being part of the web of life. If we are part of the earth and the earth is hurting, as we know, then it is only normal that we hurt as well. It's a normal response, not a pathological one. And the more knowledge we have about the huge loss of biodiversity and how it is affecting our very existence as human beings, it is not surprising that there is more fear, more anxiety, more despair presenting. Um, we are not just uh, sustainably uh, uns living unsustainably physically, but we are also living unsustainably psychologically. So there's, uh, in terms of healing, I think there's a twofold aspect to it. One is we need to have all the information and then we are going to have to face the inevitable despair and sadness that arises from that destruction. But hopefully this awareness will bring us into wanting to care for the earth and to care for the healing of the earth. And in this video, uh, you see how people are caring for, for it in whatever way is appropriate for them whether it's minding bees or birds or butterflies or hedgerows or hens or trees or soil or seeds um, or clean air or gardens. What is really lovely is this work is not difficult work. It's healing work. And the more that we connect with nature and relax in its beauty, the more we are healed itself. And there's been a lot of scientific research to show that being in nature decreases our stress, makes us happier, makes us more creative, and what is even more wonderful, makes us care for others. There's a lot of research and the awe that a lot of us experience being in nature diminishes our big sense, our big egos, and brings us into a greater sense of working collaboratively. Um, my practices have been, uh, especially during this pandemic, of spending more time in nature, trying to be more present to the wonderful sounds and sights and smells of nature. And it often generates great gratitude in me. And we all know that gratitude is wonderful for us. I think of the last line of Mary Oliver's poem, The Wild Geese, where she says, Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, and announcing your place over and over in the family of things. The other thing I've been doing in the last few months has been growing and uh, uh, sowing seeds and germinating seeds for this wonderful uh, Kuhn Bio educational space uh, which we, uh, is connected to the farm. Um, and what I want to say about the seeds is these seeds are all seeds that have been saved by our farm or by people who give us their seeds in exchange for seeds we give them or from seed savers. And just really the importance of saving our own seeds. It is a way of us preserving um, proper, reliable, generic resources for the future generation. And we need to do this to collect seeds in the face of all the corporate entities who are getting bigger and bigger. Um, and it is our way of being resilient, having seeds that are for our local climate in the face of climate change, that will uh, adapt to the changing weather, weather patterns and then possible food security shortages. Hi, I'm Vicky and I'm part of a Dark Sky Astronomy group here in Clock Jordan Eco Village. We have been meeting as a group for a few years now and together we learn about basic backyard astronomy. 
we learn about the individual stars that we can see in the night sky, the constellation patterns and the planets we can see at the moment. We also learn how to use binoculars and an online planetarium with star maps. We cover topics on light pollution and its effects on a night sky, biodiversity and health. It's quite startling to know that at the moment, only 20% of the world's population can see the Milky Way. We here in the Eco Village are in the process of looking at dark sky compliant lighting designs that still provide safety on the ground, yet still helps towards protecting biodiversity, health and dark sky viewing. We also have a designated area within the Eco Village called the Dark Sky Ball, where we can comfortably stargaze and hold night events. The Sky Ball is currently being developed with some exciting ideas to make this area more comfortable and pleasant to be in. Anybody can join a dark sky group. I often find talking about stargazing is a great way to connect with people of all ages and backgrounds. Generally, most people have something to say about the night sky. And I'm often surprised how many people would like to learn more. As a group, we have generously been given many books and star maps from our community and look forward to holding an information evening. This will also include storytelling, covering some of the myths and legends about the stars and constellations and bringing in professional astronomers. I find stargazing a wonderful way to connect with nature and the wonders of life. At the moment, if it's a clear morning, a few of us are getting up at 4.30 so we can see Jupiter and Saturn in the early morning sky. And because we're in the month of May, we also get to experience the dawn chorus. I find these little adventures in our surrounding area takes us out of our routine and helps us to be present to what is happening around us in nature and the sky. I find these times create memorable memories and bring a lot of joy. It's very humbling and awe-inspiring to look up and learn about the night sky and to think of the multitudes of galaxies and their many, many stars and star systems. I also feel an incredible wonder to hear the universe is still expanding and unfolding in its creativity and that all of life, elements, minerals, plants, animals, humans, the past and present is part of this journey too. I'm Pat Bow. Um, I live on a step road in Clock Jordan, um, literally at the back of the eco village. <laughs> okay, I have 10 hens. This is where they live at night, only at night because of foxes and pine martens and that around here. There are a lot of foxes, pine martens, weasels. So they're terrified, absolutely terrified of them. Beautiful hens, I got them. There were six sore little things. All rescued, beautiful, now beautiful and healthy. I get about eight to ten eggs a day. Come on, chuck chucks, out of the hens. Um, they keep me going. They, you, you could live if you wanted to. You could very easily live on your with your hens. Um, you can get two meals a day. The big thing, of course, is you get eggs. The fantastic thing here, as you can see, we have a, our big thing is a garden. When I die, I don't want a headstone. I want to leave a garden. Um, and in a garden, you have no slugs, you have nothing. You have your hens, everything is clean. Everything is beautiful and clean. Um, no worrying about see, putting those pellets, sick pellets down to kill slugs. Um, your hens just clear everything out. Everybody is happy, the hens are happy, we're happy. Um, they give me a feeling of, I retired September 12 months ago. Come on, Chuck Chucks. I retired and uh, I felt very beaten and very beaten by the system. And being 65, I suppose, and haven't been ill. But I got the, when I got the hens, the minute I got the hens, I knew I had solved the problem. They could recover from their life. I could recover from my life. Um, and I feel, I really genuinely feel that I am perfectly healthy, emotionally, spiritually through the hens. They, they like being over here. They just love being at the seat. Um, they just want to, they always feel that, because we eat a lot of our meals here. They always feel that there's going to be something here for them. Um, and it's very important. It's also very important to get up on our laps, to get up on the seat beside us. It's a place where they're not afraid. 
Um, and anywhere the fear leaves their lives, they just love being in it. They love being in their, in their little house because it's warm, it's insulated. Um, they're just the most fantastic little things. Um, I don't know why anybody would ill treat them to get an egg out of them. It's just, it's sinful. It's absolutely sinful. Sinful as in the Greek falling short of. Um, who wouldn't want hens? They're the most, the most, they bring animation to the place. If you ever watch them, your garden is flat enough, and particularly during the winter, and all of a sudden you see these little old fellas with their hands in their pockets running at you. Um, and you can't help but smile at them. Come on, Chuck Chucks, we'll go a bit further afield. They can follow me around all day. I have company. Um, I have, as you can see here, we have our, some vegetables, like cabbage and that, and every year, that I have tried, they were eaten alive with slugs. But this year, nothing, because the hens are here. The hens eat the slugs. It's, it's a, what's the word, system? It runs around just so beautifully. And I have to keep the hens out of for a couple of months. Again, in the tunnel, for a couple of months of the year, I don't let them in. The rest of the year, they go in and they have their, what do you call it, dirt bats. And they're just so happy in there. They spend, Days. They have a little hole at the side that they come in and out at. They cut the hole in the tunnel themselves. They never do any damage on us. Um, they try to clean the pond. We have a lot of um, that weed on the pond. Um, I don't particularly like them being at the pond because we have newts and that. It's a, it's a totally alive pond. But because we're so near to the bogs, we get all these newts and all these different things in it. Uh, you get the king slugs and it's just magnificent pond, but they, they like being at the, like looking into the pond. Uh, I'd say they're possibly afraid of falling in. Um, so I'm building another little pond, a small pond at the end that they can get into. Um, my neighbors, they never, ever, ever go out of the garden. We can have the gates open. The neighbor's fence can be down. They won't go anywhere. They're just quite happy to be where they are. Now they have all found their little areas for the day that they can scratch at. And they're as happy as Larry. Give them about two hours and they'll be so happy. Then they'll come back and they'll want a bit of food. Um, and they'll want a bit of, it seems like compassion. They just want to get up beside you. This particular hen here, we could call her Miss Candy. Um, and uh, she's particularly aggressive. Um, she's the one that gets over, out over her coop in the morning. She gets out quite early in the morning. We let her into the house. We sit her down, give her a little bit of food. And she spends probably two hours in the house in the morning just being with us and calming down. But you can notice that, that how much she will calm down during the day after she only got about a half an hour now this morning <clears throat> uh, but normally she would be in until about 12. Chuck Chuck. She's very beautiful hen uh, but anything if she sees anything she'll pick it. She's also very aggressive with the other hens but uh, like all people hurt and, and things hurt it's cured by loving not by rules and beating and taking food away, etc. She gets, she gets as much or more than anybody else. Chug, chug, chug. So that's my hens. Wonderful little thing. She's coming back again. There you go, Candy. If anybody ever saw Pose, they will understand the character, po can Miss Candy in Pose, and they will know. And when Candy dies in Pose, you realize what a beautiful, calm and hurt person she was. Our candy is the same. Here, candy. Well, the benefits of Tai Chi, I think, are widely known. But since we've been doing Tai Chi in the open air during the pandemic, which is over for over a year now, we have our the benefits have been enhanced by the fact that we're doing it in out in the open air. We're close to nature. We've gone through every season with Tai Chi in the last year. And uh, 
the 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 lack of air pollution as we're doing Tai Chi and Qigong um, is evident in our practice. Uh, also the fact that we're close to the sounds of nature and the sights of nature. We've seen the trees go from being bare. They're now in leaf. We've heard the birds. Um, and uh, the benefits of being, of, again, of being practicing out in the open air, I think, are evident to us all. Yeah, the benefit of Chai Chi on doing it on the outside rather than being indoors is um, the, the fresh air. You're breathing in nice fresh air. Also, you're listening to the sounds of boards. And uh, now sometimes we do get an odd person uh, cutting a lawn or something like that. But uh, in Tai Chi is to not let things ex uh, distract you from what you're doing, like your moves and that. Hi, I'm Deirdre O'Leary. Um, so biodiversity to me is, is really what we're all depending on. We can't survive without it. But I think that all, ha everybody's heard that now and I think it's actually overwhelming and a lot of people are even in denial, I, I would imagine, because it's, it's too much for us. With all the rest of the bad news that gets presented to us, I think we need to go back to what is it we're trying to protect? And, you know, do we love that? And I think the only way we can remember how to love nature is to remember that nature is actually what's nurturing us. None of our food is produced without nature. And in fact, we are nature, we're part of nature. So this is something I do every day. Um, this, this is how nur nature nurtures me directly. Um, this is Hawthorne and this beautiful Hawthorne tree volunteered here as they often do and you have to be very careful with Hawthorne trees because they're um, they're fairy trees <laughs> so you can't uh, you can't just do whatever you like to a Hawthorne tree um, we, we trim it but I trim it very carefully so that I don't anger the fairies because <laughs> I do half believe in that stuff um, and so but if I ask carefully and if I, I choose leaves that look like, I mean, for instance, if I choose some leaves from over here, those are kind of getting in the way of, they're gonna grow into the wall, so they won't mind being picked. Um, so I've got three young hawthorn leaves here and I'm putting it into my tea. Um, hawthorn is amazing for your heart. Um, it actually has uh, phytochemicals in it that are, um, that help us to regenerate um, tissue. So it's really helpful for all sorts of um, heart conditions. Um, and yeah, it, it regenerates the, the, the tissue that we need in our veins, in our arteries. Um, so we're having some of this hawthorn. Then right beside it are these nettles. Um, nettles are needed by us, but they're also needed by a lot of butterflies. The, um, you can see, can you see this nettle? How, I'm not going to take this nettle because it's all folded over. So somebody's got here first. So that's another uh, another insect. I'm not an insect, but an insect has has laid its um, its babies of some kind in here. So we're going for nettle tops that don't have something laid in them. Here's another one that's being inhabited uh, just here. Um, so we're going for the nettle tops that aren't already taken by something else. And if you, you don't have to do it like this, but if you grasp the nettle, but you only want the top four leaves, and if you just take them like that, they don't sting you. Um, nettles are amazing. They're full of um, iron, actually. They also have serotonin in them, which is a brain and neurotransmitter, which we need. Um, they're, they're a very good tonic for spring and um, they say if you have three good feeds of of nettle soup before May is out sets you up for the year um, and I'm also going to take some of this beautiful mint and um, 
this is just growing wild here, but I have to say it was um, encouraged to grow wild there. And <laughs> just for its flavor and its cooling. Um, this is cleavers right beside it. Cleavers are often seen as um, really a, um, an invasive weed by some. I would reserve that uh, term for um, things that are not native to here because cleavers are native and they're very supportive to, uh, to the insects um, that are native here too. Um, and they're also very good for us. They're very good for our uh, lymphatic system and getting all of that moving at this time of year. And I'm gonna take some of these and they don't mind being picked. And right beside them, cleavers actually, if you, if you taste them in tea, they, they, taste like, um, they taste like green peas. They're very tasty. Um, right beside them here, we have dandelion leaves. Dandelions are amazing too. Dandelions in France are known as pisson lit, which is wet bed. And um, it's because they're a diuretic, they're a very strong diuretic. But they also, like with chemical diuretics, with synthetic diuretics, you would be encouraged to take um, potassium as well. I leave ones that the birds haven't pooed on. Um, you would be encouraged to take potassium as well um, so that you don't get dehydrated if you were taking synthetic diuretics. But actually, um, dandelions are the complete package. They're full of potassium themselves. Um, yes, what else have we got here? Nettles are also really needed by comma butterflies and small tortoise shell butterflies. And everybody loves peacock butterflies. They need nettles too. Um, this here, I'll have to look it up, but I think this is clove root and um, wood avens. So yeah, look, it's about to flower. So I'm not gonna take any of this today, but in October, we can dig these up um, or, you know, not too many of them, but since they're, since they're beside my house and not in wildland where you can't dig anything up, um, I can dig a couple of them up and use the roots to flavor some brandy as clove and um, really tasty. Um, what else is here? We won't go anywhere near this beautiful flower because it's ranunculus and um, it's buttercup and it's beautiful and great for bees and pollinators but um, poisonous to humans. Um, you can see that the dandelions have gone to seed here and, and a lot of them have blown away or being eaten. Um, we have goldfinches and um, coal tits and blue tits um, who, and great tits who've been eating these and uh, munching away on them. And through here. Actually this, the, the willow here was covered in um, some kind of uh, small insect, absolutely covered um, last year and and two long-tailed tits came along, which are the cutest little birds. They're so gorgeous. Um, so two long-tailed tits just fed here for a couple of days and, and rescued, rescued the willow. If you'd like to come this way. In fact, raspberry leaves. We could put some raspberry leaves in too. Raspberry leaves, they won't mind this one, I think, um, are full of tannins, which are really good at um, tightening up anything that needs to be tightened up, so a loose cough, um, uh, loose skin. They can actually be used in some hemorrhoid preparations, if such was needed. Um, moving on through here, this is seen as, so like so many of our native, uh, especially our robust native plants that aren't rare, um, plantain, this is ribbert plantain, very familiar at the top here, um, ribbert plantain. Um, it's, it's, it's known as a weed to so many people, but of course all of our native plants tend to be known as weeds. Um, plantain is an amazing plant. It's, um, I put it in my tea, I look for a leaf that won't be missed. Um, if you're going for salad, um, you want the young leaves. Um, for tea, it's not so important. This is a nice healthy plant, so it won't mind me taking a couple of leaves. Um, uh, the leaves of plantain are amazing. Um, they're, they're, they're great in tea or in, they, they taste of mushrooms, um, kind of nutty and mushroomy. Um, they're great in pesto, but they're also 
Um, they can they're used by herbalists to um, as a um, um, as an antiseptic and a, a vulnerary, so something that'll heal wounds. And um, just beside it, there is some tiny little yarrow. So this little yarrow here, and here's some more of it just growing wild. We'll take some of that too, just a little bit. Um, I'm not sure what yarrow is going to do uh, inside my tea, but it's very useful um, as a um, um, as a plant that will stop bleeding. Actually, it used to be used by doctors in the um, on battlefields, um, and I love it. Thank you. Um, let me see all the lovely weeds, um, and of course. So fennel is not, natu not, not native here, but it is naturalized and it's everywhere now. It's, it's a garden escape. Um, so it grows wild all over Ireland now. Um, and I think we're allowed to take this one. Um, and it is absolutely delicious at all times of year. When it seeds, it's really tasty too. Um, so that's going in there. Actually, we'll take a bit more. This plant is a bit small. Oh, I'll take some from this plant here. That one looks beautiful. Um, yeah, we have a lot of docks here. I don't, um, um, a more, a more um, perfectionist gardener, <laughs> which you can see I'm not, <laughs> would be removing the docks. I do remove them when they're getting in the way of plants that I really want to favor, but the docks, what they do is they, they, when they go to seed, they send up seeds that are just fantastic for, um, for, for all the tits and the finches during the, the rest of the year and um, during the, the hungry season for, for birds. Our garden is also full of ants and worms and grasshoppers. Um, oh, here's some lovely duck seeds already. Uh, maybe that's more in flower. And the, um, so we have, we have all sorts of um, birds that feed here, like the wrens and the robins, they love the, um, the they, they're not as keen on the seeds, they go for the insects. We had um, a pair of breeding missile thrushes who, who bred for the first time in the lime tree over there this year. And so we, so we had the um, privilege of seeing the, the missile thrush that fledged uh, being shown how to hop around the garden here and pick worms and um, uh, caterpillars uh, and, and even catching butterflies in, in, in mid-flight um, uh, here in the garden. Um, and lastly, lastly here, oh, maybe second lastly, this is lemon balm. I'm not sure if anybody would actually see this as a weed, but it's, it's a very beautiful flavor. The, the lemon balm, so we'll add that into the tea. It grows very happily here. And then the last one is a, a native plant that has taken up, um, made its residence in our, uh, in among our vines. This is a vine. <laughs> um, this is a very familiar plant to anybody who, who lives near wild spaces. This is, um, this is Herb Robert. Um, it's a geranium, geranium robertianum. Um, and it's, it's often known as um, a plant that you can take a leaf of and rub on your forehead if you want to keep the midges away or something like that. But in fact, it's, it's much more valuable than that. And, and we'll just take a few leaves that aren't going to be missed. Um, Herb Robert is an interesting one. My herbalist teacher, Nikki Darrell, talks about this plant as being great for boundaries so it's very good for connecting you back into who you are and allowing you to sort out what's yours and what's a projection of somebody else's which is a very nice um, way to look at it so I only take a little bit of this plant um, beautiful Herb Robert and that's it and we're going to pour boiling water in there and drink this I'd also make this into pesto quite regularly this this mixture Thanks.
Hi, uh, welcome everybody to the Sensory and Wildlife Garden. Uh, it originally was the Sensory Garden, but we have really felt that it is full of wildlife around here and that we would include that as also as an educational thing for uh, adults and children. So the Gardin Kate Fui Agus Fihulra Askwelige. So here now we have Gemma and she's looking after the area around these basically wildflowers that we planted last year and the interesting thing about them is they don't necessarily come up the following year, they can come up two years later. So that's a kind of an interesting thing about wildflowers that are planted in that way. So we're going to go in here now under this wonderful lime tree, which is the anchor point of the Sensory and Wildlife Garden and we've got our lovely bee entrance. Uh, thanks to Des and Patricia and Caroline and right here on our left the garden was a sensory garden as I said so the five senses but here was a sixth space and this space was uh, was to be called awe a w e awe but we actually decided it's a lovely woodland space so we've created a nice circular area for people to stand in and then we collected old bits of wood we've got that lovely wood pile under the tree where all the bugs will be very very happy and we have brought in some ferns and local people have contributed in that way which is wonderful and of course we've lots of nettles over here which are their favourites of butterflies and many others and we are now all making, of course, nettle soup because it's that time of year and great for the blood. Um, right at the centre here is our bug hotel. And it was made by many hands and volunteers who were around and so on. And yesterday I was delighted to see a bee going in and out because we think of it as a bug hotel, but somehow maybe we don't think of the bees. And I actually have bee bombs here in my hand because we are going to plant these uh, later uh, to uh, cu cultivate flowers for the bees. And, uh, and you just throw it in onto a clean bed and uh, it, will, it will come up over the next two years. Uh, we've got the five senses here. Uh, all in Asquelica, Agus Asperla, so we're bilingual. So here we've got sight, our Ryark, and we're slightly early in the season and we're going to have wonderful terracotta lupins coming up here. And of course, lots of calendula and wonderful uh, geranium, the true geranium as we call it, uh, and phlox. And uh, then in the next bed, we have bulla or smell and of course we need to touch the plant and the children learn to gently touch the plant, rub it together, the oregano, the sage, the rosemary, the, uh, the rosemary and the thyme and then these again are phlox. So each of these has a lovely scent and of course we can eat them all or most of them in, in our culinary things. And I'd like to draw your attention to our wonderful seat here because it is a nice area to sit. Everything again recycled. Uh, and thanks to Owen, we've got these little, they remind me of gazelles or something with the little legs and you can sit quietly here. So it's really to invite people to enjoy the reflective nature of the space as well as the children loving running round. They absolutely love this, uh, especially the very young children, which is fantastic. And what might look like untidiness is actually another home for bugs. So bits and pieces of wood and bricks around. And uh, as we go into the taste area, our bluff, we've got our raised beds. They are not planted yet, as you can see. It's a bit early. But um, we've got last year's uh, broccoli uh, still here. And it keeps coming. I've picked this a number of times. It just keeps coming. And then here we'll have our moorine, which is our compost. And the compost is not only useful for when we work where we put stuff, but also it is full of wildlife, of course. Lots and lots of bugs and um, little riggedy things and everything. And around the edges we've put in various herbs and mint and chives. We've got some strawberries here. And uh, this area we'll have, we're going to put, maybe we'll throw a few of our bee bombs here. And uh, we should have some wildflowers here this summer. And the, in the coming year, they'll just keep coming back. But when we talk in terms of wildflowers, we often omit to realise that the, the most nutritious 
in many ways so-called wildflowers we call them weeds and we clear them out uh, so here we're cultivating allowing the wonderful docks to grow and of course what particularly fascinates me is those big seeds that come in the autumn and winter and when there's nothing else for the birds to eat we would find in our garden maybe five or six birds on one plant which is extraordinary in the most cold weather and then we've the thistle of course and we've already mentioned the nettles that we're all familiar with. So just on the theme of biodiversity uh, we were extending the garden out around here simply because we had a pheasant behind this mound uh, nesting last year and it so inspired us to make an area where birds would feel safe uh, to nest and so that they nested there. Then we had the blackbird that nested right halfway up the tree here, a kind of an open nest and it had two little ones. So we thought, what about the ground nesting birds in Ireland? They're very small and they like to be on the ground. So this is just the beginning you're seeing of an area that we will continue to cut the hawthorn, the blackthorn, because we have lots of little um, prickly things to discourage anyone else from going in, animals uh, especially of course and we will cut it every year and it will develop into a thicket this whole length here and then the birds will be able to nest safely there and around the edge we will include more trees right around the edge here and all the other plants we've planted have berries in the autumn for wildlife obviously and also appearance and then the flowers in the summer which are wonderful of course for the bees. So that's kind of a general feel of the area. We planted a whole circle of, of the Irish bluebells around here and they said they won't come well in the first year and they haven't but we look forward to them next year. Okay my name is Gay and I'm working here in this beautiful sensory garden. And to me this garden is really a place of tranquillity and I find it like a haven that calms my mind and my heart and I just love coming here. And every time I walk in here I just need to take time to breathe in and enjoy its beauty and, and just let the peace of this place enter into my life and just let the joy and the, and the energy uh, fill me more and more. And also, as I'm breathing in, I'm aware and I'm mindful of the gift of each of the senses. And I know that people have come in here with autism and have found that here has been a good place for them to be. And children have come in bouncing and feeling the joy of the place and feeling the energy of the place and bringing their own joy into the place as well. And it's just lovely to see. And it's just to take time here to sit down and breathe it in and let go of anxiety and stress. I think that that's what this garden is really about. And I'm so grateful for it. And sometimes I find myself even bringing in the whole world into it because of... of, of India and Brazil and Nepal and and all of the uh, anxieties are now around the Palestinians and the war. We can bring them all into this place and send the energy of here out. It's like a little oasis that can go out to the whole world. Hi, I'm Lynn. I walk under the same stand of trees most days. They make me feel less self-important, less like I'm out there on my own, trying to stay upbeat in a world of concrete. I feel lighter and smaller and part of a team. The more time I've spent with the trees, the more all of their personalities seem to emerge. The birches with their dappled sunlight and bright trunks, and the ancient beaches overlooking animal tracks and hideaways. The apples and the cherry trees weighed down with their blossoms like they're on their way to an enormous family celebration. The hawthorns, who always look so Celtic to me, quietly existing on the edges of things, calm and spiky and beautiful all at once. All these trees purify the air and the water, stabilise our soil, help prevent floods, store carbon, provide homes and shelter for hundreds of animals, including us. 
We are just another species of animal in their shelter. We are kin. How could you not care for them? It would be like cutting off your own arm. <laughs>